This is Pop Health Week on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm Greg Masters, your co-host and executive producer, as well as the managing director at Health Innovation Media. It's a pleasure to be joined in our state-of-the-art virtual studio by Fred Goldstein, the co-founder and principal co-host of Pop Health Week and the president of Accountable Health, LLC. Pop Health Week is your trusted source for engaging discussions with top industry leaders and stakeholders from various sectors, including payers, providers, patients, vendors, and regulators. We're dedicated to sharing the most innovative ideas and strategies in population health. To connect with us, visit www.popupstudio.productions or feel free to send me a direct message on Twitter via at Greg Masters MPH, and that is Greg with two G's. Fred Goldstein is also available at FS Goldstein or at www.accountablehealthllc.com. We are excited about today's show as we welcome Lauren Barca, MHA, RN, MSN, the VP of Quality and Stars at 86 Borders. Lauren brings over a decade of experience from United Healthcare and is known for her exceptional work in STARS, HEDIS, CAPS, and HOS initiative. A champion for public health, Lauren is dedicated to improving care quality for those who are economically disadvantaged and medically underserved. Today, we'll explore the intricacies of member engagement and the importance of addressing everyday life challenges to enhance healthcare outcomes. We'll also delve into the social determinants of care and how they align with fundamental public health practices. Now, let's pass the microphone to Fred. Over to you. Thanks so much, Greg and Lauren. Welcome to Pop Health Week. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So let's begin with a little bit of your background and uh, some of the work you're doing now. Thank you. I always love to call myself a public health nurse at the root of it all. Uh, My roots are in Knox County, Tennessee, where I started really in the public health system. That's really uh, social determinants of health before we were calling it SDOH. Understanding that if we do not help address basic human need, that self-actualization in healthcare is not achievable. Um, so that's that's really where all of this started, my healthcare journey. A little bit of uh, behavioral health mixed in, epidemiology. When you're a public health nurse, you kind of do, do it all. Um, everything from on the streets to in the clinic to on the spreadsheets, whatever's needed. Um, that really moved me into uh, state government. I worked for the Tennessee Department of Medicaid, Ten Care, for uh, four and a half years and learned so much about Medicaid, health policy, really developing systems for managed care and how payers have a huge um, part to play in population health and framing the health of our country and how um, everyone has to work together in this health system, not just providers, but the payers too and the policy side. It was such an enriching part of my health uh, health journey um, as, as an employee. Um, from there, I spent over 10 years at United Healthcare, got a master's in nursing, um, worked at the national and state levels to develop programs in population health, case management, utilization management, um, spent time volunteering with um, various community-based organizations, really started to um, understand what it was like to be on the other side of that claim and uh, realize it's it's so much more to that journey when a, a patient seeks care. And finally, now I am with a care coordination company, 86 Borders. Um, Their role is to locate patients, engage patients, get them involved back in their care, Um, really coming full circle to my population health journey. Uh, It's right back at the beginning, finding patients, getting them back into health. Um, So I love to say I've, I've come full circle. 
<laughs> it's really fantastic. And and by the way, let's discuss the unique name 86 Borders. Where yeah, I love this story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the term 86, I don't know if you're familiar, if you've been in the restaurant industry or even, even in the military, um, 86 means to do away, to, to get rid of, to kill something. Um, so we are getting rid of borders. We are re- removing those barriers to care. We are enabling people to have access to the health care services that they so desperately need and deserve. Uh, we're a care coordination model that just opens doorways, uh, makes the road easier because we know how difficult it can be to navigate the healthcare system. Yeah, when I think uh, back to my Medicaid days, you know, I always say if you can make the system work in Medicaid or for individuals who are living and, and beneficiaries of Medicaid system, you really can make it work anywhere. It's definitely a, a population that needs considerable help, but actually is there willing and waiting and wanting to get it. Absolutely. Um, I I think all the time about how difficult forms are to read, how hard websites are to navigate, how complicated words are, even for me as a very educated and experienced um, healthcare person, it can still be very confusing at times. I get frustrated when I get put on hold at my doctor's office. I think, you know what, I'm going to call another day. It's, you know, I, today is not the day to get a dermatology appointment. I don't have the 14 minutes to wait. And so really thinking about ways in which we can make it easier particularly for vulnerable populations, thinking about seniors, thinking about those who do not have access to basic human needs, you know, the Medicare, the Medicaid, the dual eligible population, even the uninsured, uh, which I think is is a very important under talked about population or underinsured population. It's really difficult to, to get the care that's so needed. So as you started out, as you said, with the state, what did you see there and how did that viewpoint impact what you do today? Um, Well, starting out in public health completely um, changed everything. I'd like to back up to just even fresh out of nursing school. You know, when you get out of nursing school, you've got such big, bright eyes. You're going to Florence Nightingale, the, the world. And, you know, I was immediately taken into homes in which even in Tennessee, in which, you know, there was not electricity, there was no running water. I was doing a program at the time called Hugs Help Us Grow Successfully, which was a newborn nurses home visiting program in which I was teaching basic diapering skills uh, to individuals in which they did not even have adequate housing. So really thinking about um, SDOH at its core really began uh, my journey to realizing if we're expecting members, patients, individuals, whatever term we want to use, to follow very complex diet plans, medication plans, regimens, you know, we always as um, healthcare providers love to say, you know, exercise more, lose weight, eat healthy food. And then there I was going into to homes in which really inadequate housing, a lot of barriers were being faced. And it, it's not as simple as just Hey, go do this. Go go follow these instructions. Um, Drive your car to the pharmacy was even difficult because there was no car. It was hard to find someone who could even take them to a pharmacy, then finding money to pay that friend for gas to get to the pharmacy, you know, figuring out who was going to perform child care if they were going to be employed. Just so many complex issues were present, issues that I had not even fully recognized, Um, you know, thinking about a diaper crisis in our nation. Diapers were not covered under SNAP benefits were not covered under WIC benefits. And then I had moms telling me they're saying I can't bring my child to the daycare unless I have eight to 10 diapers a day. There are no government programs. Medicaid's not paying for this. My WIC benefits aren't paying for this. My food stamps are not paying for this. How am I supposed to have eight to 10 diapers a day to take my baby to daycare? 
So, and and then how am I supposed to work? <laughs> and so it's just it's so eye opening. So fundamentally, we have to recognize people are coming from very difficult and complex situations, and it's not so easy as just let me prescribe you something to do and you go do it. I like the fact, sadly, that you were thrown right into it, right at a nursing <laughs> school. You're doing these home visits. You're doing addressing all these issues. And in my journey, before I knew what social determinants of health were back in the late 90s, I used to have a slide that said, people can't focus on their health because their life gets in the way. Let's solve those issues first, and then we'll go after their health issues, which is exactly what you're talking about doing, which now has a renaissance. It's come back again. Right. You know, absolutely. You were doing it then in a public health realm, but it just wasn't linked. And then you go off to the to the plan realm. And what, right. what, what does that viewpoint do to how you've looked at this? Absolutely. Health plans for the last several years have been really focused on SDOH and how it impacts their members, not only from a customer satisfaction standpoint. I think health plans are really uh, starting to realize that they have to retain members and grow their health plans. Um, part of that involves keeping healthy, happy members. And that all starts with um, really SDOH. If, if you can't impact their basic human needs, you really can't impact anything else related to total cost of care. And then beyond that, health plans are really focused on their star ratings, their HEDAs, their CAPS, all of those NCQA and CMS measures. They're really looking for ways in which they can begin to move those scores up to become a higher rated plan, to increase their validity in the industry, um, to, to really uh, think about how they can make an impact there. And so many of those quality scores at the, at the root of it are tied to SDOH issues. And so it's, it's really interesting how uh, the industry is, is finally catching up to public health. And population health is really synonymous with SDOH these days. And this is really about, as you've mentioned before, at the root, it's about engagement, which is what 86 Borders does, right? Absolutely. Um, so if a health plan uh, can find a member... Uh, then they have every door open to them. The same for a provider. If a provider can find a member and get them engaged and figure out what it's going to take to get them involved in their health care, then it's going to be so much more successful. If a provider and or health plan cannot find a member, if they're on that unable to reach, unable to locate, then chances are that member is later going to be hugely costly to both the provider, to the health plan, is going to really impact that total cost of care, um, really bad health outcomes for, for that patient. So it's, it's really important to think about preventative care is also a piece of SDOH. And this is really a change in thinking because it's always used to be, well, I'm worried about the person in front of me. I'm worried about the patient in the clinic. No, we've got to start worrying about those that aren't showing up, which is exactly what you get at. And then how do you do that? That's right. Um, you have to, to your point, you have to be worried about that patient who's not in the clinic. Those are the ones that should be keeping providers and health plans up at night. Part of 86 Borders' mission is to find them. Uh, so what we do is we use every public and private data source available to us, almost like a private investigator model, to locate them. And then the second piece to that is really the engagement piece. It's talking to individuals like they are truly humans. You know, there's a technology piece to this. That's everyone has the technology piece, right? You know, we're, we're so far advanced. It's really the human aspect that I think sets 86 borders apart. It's using humans to talk to humans about how would I want to be talked to? How would I want to be treated? If I were a missing patient, so to speak, you know, if I had not sought care in two years, if I had all of these outstanding preventative services, if I were a vulnerable patient, if I had SDOH needs, how would I want to be spoken to? And that would be with empathy, with understanding. Uh, so we use really highly trained care coordinators. We do lots of active listening. 
they're really well prepared to know how to respond when a patient begins going down a pathway that sounds like the root of the issue is SDOH. And it's not just, well, here's a phone number you could call, or here's a, you know, you have a food bank 20 miles from you. Um, That's really not enough of a solution. I think that such an important piece to SDOH is really being able to follow through actively helping to be a part of that solution. So whether that's warm handoffs, three-way calls, um, home delivery of medications and or other things that could be provided at the home level, um, arranging of transportation directly, and then the follow through. The, The closing of that loop is crucial to this. You know, mailing someone a yellow pages of food banks in their state is this, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, So we really got to get to a point in which we close those loops on those social needs referrals. And we think, how would we want to be treated if we were in that situation? And that's with dignity and respect. If you're just tuning in, we're in the company of Lauren Barca, MHA, RN, MSN, the VP of Quality and Stars at 86 Borders. We're discussing the vital connections between health plans and their members, especially those who are inactive, hard to reach, so, or underserved. You know, it all sounds great, and, and obviously is, and a lot of it's going back to basics. Like you said, it's not just about the tech, it's about a human being relating language they want to hear. In a, in a way they accept it, culturally appropriate. Right. So I see all these people out there that push all this stuff like this. But then I say, well, what are your outcomes? So can you talk some about your outcomes, what's happened as you, it, through this program? Yes, absolutely. We've got some really great outcomes. Um, one of the ones I love to talk about is we were working with a patient-centered medical home in Nashville, Tennessee, an FQHC and um, our role was to help get patients back into the provider's office. And these are patients who had not seen a provider in 18 months, two years, greater, sometimes not at all. This, this is that unable to reach list. And uh, with that list, we had a 247% increase in attended appointments, Fred, not just in scheduled, uh, because that doesn't mean anything to schedule an appointment, you know, in in attended appointments, um, a really great stat. And uh, we love to talk about that one. Um, Something else I think so important is medication adherence. Uh, We were working with a payer about diabetes and statin medications. Uh, This was a list of individuals who their medication was filled and then returned to the pharmacy because they never went and picked it up. Uh, So we know that they were not not taking it. Um, And so from that group, we had an 84% engagement rate. Um, so this was this was a group of individuals that the health plan had already attempted to locate and had considered unable to find. We not only found them, but we spoke to 84% of them. 60% of them began taking that medication through one of our interventions. The other 20% was referred to um, and scheduled scheduled with a provider appointment following that interaction with one of our care coordinators. So so some really amazing outcomes just from humans listening to humans, showing empathy and respect um, in in their chosen language without having to use a language line figuring out how to remove those barriers to care, um, knocking down those walls and doing what it takes uh, to, to make sure that healthcare can be accessed. Yeah. And I think of the first example you gave, remember back in the day that it was fairly typical, you just scheduled, you just double booked all your Medicaid appointments. Right. But now, obviously, if you get that accomplished, you don't have to do that anymore. It becomes a much more efficient system, obviously. And and uh, of course, you would assume, as I, I assume you were also tracking this, you begin to see better outcomes, clinical outcomes, et cetera, amongst the members. That's right. Um, well, you know, at first you have a little bit worse outcomes because you have all these new new diagnoses that you weren't expecting. Uh, when you have a population that has historically not sought care, 
at first, you may have a, a surprise diagnosis the first time they see the provider. And then over time, you have a really uh, reduced total cost of care. Um, longitudinally, we have a 10% reduction in total cost of care in our programs that have run for 18 months or greater. Uh, you have to think about that longstanding relationship and how with time and and care and really removing those barriers that so many vulnerable populations face, that this does work. It does save the, the healthcare system money, and, and it's the right thing to do when you think about it. That's, that's great. One of the other things that I think I understand about how you work, which is something that always unnerved me when I looked at these care management programs, was that they would be so structured, it would be like, okay, if they're low risk level, we're just going to call them every three months. If they're moderate risk, maybe we do it every month and a half or something. And if they're high risk, maybe we do it once a month or something. But I always looked at this and said, I don't think that's flexible enough. You have to look at each patient as an individual and determine how much they might need. So we provided a lot of leeway to our staff. Is it similar there in terms of how you structure your your uh, outreach, et cetera? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up staffing models in general. I think staffing models are really one of the most dangerous things to, to healthcare and to population health in general. Um, I know why, you know, hospitals and health plans need them, you know, for planning purposes, for fiscal assignments, et cetera. But from an individual to individual standpoint, it can be very difficult. At 86 Borders, it is never a one size fits all. Everything is tailored, not just to an individual need, but we recognize that different geographic areas have different needs. Languages may take longer to speak. Thinking about different health plans may have different preferences on what's explained during that phone call. So everything can certainly be tailored and and really using active listening from a care coordinator's standpoint to make sure everything is met from that patient standpoint, that's going to get the best outcomes uh, to ensure that patient can achieve that self-actualization and take ownership in their own health and healthcare journey. I know we're seeing this move now back to community health workers, lay health workers, getting out in the community, helping out. I think it's a great model. Where are you with that? Yeah, we we use the term care coordinator. I think care coordinator is kind of synonymous with community health worker. We hire locally uh, from the communities in which we have contracts. I think it's it's pretty close. Uh, what I'm really interested in the industry with that, Fred, is what happens with training, with oversight, with certification of the CHW. I've been watching this legislation pretty closely, uh, really, really interested from a policy standpoint, but I love to see it. I also love to see what's going to happen with the doulas and how they might play a role in this community health work and care coordinator role, um, really, as our country moves forward. Um, and, and where they, I think, are going to also help remove some barriers to care. Yeah, and I know in a couple of states I'm looking at now, they're actually working on language and training programs to certify community health workers or promotoras, et cetera. Some states have already done that, obviously, and it's I think it's great to see that. And I'm working right now, actually, with one of the clinics in a, one of these states that's launched a community health worker as well, and it's just amazing to see that in action and understand what you're able to understand by first bringing people to work for you from the group you're trying to work with, because they have obviously way more insights and then watching how they can impact that community and the individuals within it. So it's really fascinating. Where do you go from here? What do you see as the next thing to be done in this area or an area that maybe is a little weak right now? Sure. I think we're still working as a entire country on how to best connect with patients and members. I know personally, as a member of an insurance company, I am still throwing away postcards and letters that I get from my insurance company without reading them. And this is from someone who worked for an insurance company for for over 10 years. And so, you know, what is the best thing? I know there's been such a huge push in text messaging and emailing And I think as um, our population continues to be more tech savvy, 
What does that look like? Where does social media play into this? Where are various platforms? Where do people truly want to interact with their providers, with their health plans? Do they want knowledge via TikTok? I don't know. I think there's still a lot to be done with that. Um, These are just questions that I'm posing. So I think the next frontier is how do we best connect with people where they want to be connected? And, and based on how you phrase that, I assume you're going to be asking them that question maybe tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We are now, we are now on an individual basis. You know, when we're talking to them, how do you want me to call you? I think collectively, as we get more data, it's going to begin to transform the way in which providers interact with patients. And, and, you know, I know HIPAA has done so much to protect our information, but I'll tell you, you know, me logging into a patient portal is incredibly cumbersome for me to interact with my own provider, um, thinking about how difficult it is to exchange messages with my um, provider or clinician, how we can um, maintain HIPAA, but yet um, improve communication a little bit, make it a, uh, break down some of those barriers, make it a little bit easier for everyone to access the information that they need um, and, and that bi-directional communication with a provider and or clinician, I think is going to be the next step. Well, I want to thank you so much, Lauren, for coming on. It's clear that this comes from your clinical background, your intelligence, and your heart. And it comes out in your talk. So I really appreciate you coming on this week and discussing it. Well, thank you again for having me. And um, I'll come back anytime. And back to you, Greg. And that, dear friends, concludes today's broadcast. A big thank you to our wonderful listeners for joining us. And a special thanks to Lauren Barker for sharing her insights with us today. Keep up with the innovative work of 86 Borders by following them on Twitter via 86 Borders and make sure to visit their website at www.86borders.com. If you enjoy our work here at Pop Health Week, we'd love your support. Please like us on the preferred podcast platform of your choice, share our show with your peers and colleagues, and do subscribe to catch all of our upcoming episodes. Remember, we broadcast live on Healthcare Now Radio on weekdays at 5.30 a.m., 1.30 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And for our West Coast audience, tune in at 2.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and 6.30 p.m. Pacific. On behalf of the Hop Health Week team and Fred Goldstein, I'm Greg Masters wishing you continued good health and well-being. Do stay with us for more engaging conversation in health innovation that matters. And until next time, fare thee well.